Now, I think that either of those measures alone is misleading because you can improve your productivity by sacrificing your quality. Or you can improve your quality by sacrificing your productivity and say, well, let's just go slower. Let's have more code inspections. Let's, you know, let's take more time scrubbing this code. So by the time it, we finally let it go, it has fewer defects. Generally, that's a, a trade-off. So I think the, the more interesting comparison is when you multiply your productivity times your quality. And then when you do that, that's what you end up with. OK. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a couple of comments about lean, I mean about uh, the other methods here, CMMI. Uh, for instance, CMMI is, is a very interesting thing. Those of you that have read my book know that there's a question on the CMM, which is the predecessor to the CMMI. Uh, there's a, a chapter on that. But the, 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 the basic the fundamental uh, concept of the CMMI is that um, organizational improvement is a staged process, like the life of a cycle of a star, for instance, goes through distinct known stages. Or a baby, you know, you got the, um, you've got the stages, the developmental stages, stages of Piaget's work, for instance, on that. Uh, so there was a, an organization called the Center for Information Systems. I'm forgetting the name of it here. Research, yes. That uh, looked at a predecessor to the CMMI model, the five-stage model, and it was called the Nolan-Norton model, very similar thing. And they, they um, do objective studies on all sorts of things. And they really looked for evidence that, their, that uh, development improved in a, um, in a staged fashion. And after a long study, they came to the conclusion there was absolutely no correlation between the way that organizations improve and any kind of a staged process. <laughs> so what you have when you look at CMMI is a collection of um, best practices. I think some of those are, are <clears throat> rather obsolete best practices, but at least they have some justification. So it's not surprising that they have some effect. But I don't think you can look at that as a strategy for improvement. Case tools, of course, can be used on, in any kind of a environment. We, we've used them in, in lean production. Um, <clears throat> and I mentioned the limitations on reuse. So what that really leaves is the things that are, that are um, not explainable by other, other uh, reasoning, that lean and agile are by far the two most uh, effective approaches that have been uh, developed to this point. Now I'm going to spend more time talking about lean than I am about agile because there's a lot of you that are much more expert on agile than I am uh, and I've spent more of my time on lean. But I can make some philosophical comparisons and so I'm going to do that. Okay, lean production, uh, the term itself was coined relatively recently in a book in the, uh, that was uh, released in 1990. Uh, the Machine That Changed the World. Has anybody read that book? Okay. Uh, excellent book. It's still a, a wonderful book. Really recommend that you go back and, and look at it. So it's a, it's a page turner. You know, it's very, it's, it's an easy read and it's interesting. But that was, the, uh, that was the book that really introduced the Toyota ideas on a widespread basis in the West. And Womack, uh, the author, of that book, James Womack, <coughs> coined that term. It is actually uh, based on a subset of the Toyota production system, which has been amazingly effective. Of course, Toyota is now the largest automaker in the world, uh, and they're actually surviving the current global economic crisis quite well uh, because of the principles <coughs> there. Well, the Toyota production system actually is based on the works of W. Edwards Deming, who was an American uh, management uh, specialist. He actually, during World War II, he brought statistical techniques to the um, industries that were developing the aircraft and the various weapons that were used in World War II, and tremendously increased productivity and quality. So after the war, um, during the reconstruction of, of Japan, uh, 
uh, he was brought over there to teach the Japanese how to apply some of those same techniques. And, uh, and of course, there's much more to Deming than just uh, statistics, as we'll get into in a minute. So um, the works of, of Edwards Deming are sort of the, the, the uh, foundation for lean and the roof over lean. Lean exists within the world and because of the world of W. Edwards Deming. Now the sad thing is, is that in the West we have largely forgotten uh, Deming. And what we did once uh, know of him, we misunderstood. As I've, I've had a, uh, a Japanese uh, sensei master teacher, master teacher uh, tell me. Uh, so Edwards Deming is someone that we still need to remember. And, I, and he is the philosophical root for lean. So in order to do the comparison of lean and agile, we need to go back to Deming. <coughs> He thought the several things, thought that uh, everything, first of all, is a system. He thought uh, that it's important to put people first. He wasn't just a master of quality, he was a master of management and marketing. And uh, this, I think this is the most telling comment. This is uh, the um, chairman and president of Toyota for many, many years, primarily the years when Toyota was achieving its dominance in its field. And he said, every day I think about what he meant to us. I mean, that sounds like more than an objective statement, doesn't it? That sounds like there's veneration, admiration there. Deming is the core of our management. And then recently he said, now more than ever, we need to remember the teacher, teachings of Deming. So let's look at what he taught. First of all, um, he was the master of the soundbite. So he had some great quotes. This is just a few of them. The first one, uh, of course, is about the need to manage things that you cannot measure. That's an interesting uh, comment from somebody who a, has a background as a statistician, isn't it? Um, also said that if your system, and, and here he's talking about like a production system or a business system, that is meeting the needs of consumers with products. If your system's unstable, it doesn't really matter what management does. In fact, management actually makes it worse, whatever they do. Um, the prevailing system of management was not real high on his uh, regard list. <laughs> how to take the joy out of life is how he uh, characterized it. So it takes more than engineering knowledge to design. It takes what he called profound knowledge. Now this is going to be a theme in what we're going to talk about. So kind of hold on to that phrase. And then he says, if you don't have profound knowledge when you set about to uh, improve your process, that your efforts are counterproductive. All right. So his comment here is that our Western style of management does not naturally optimize things. We don't end up with the best outcomes naturally. In fact, our, our Western style of management, we naturally end up at suboptimized solutions at best. So profound knowledge gets us out of that trap. There's four parts to it. Um, the names you see here are the names that he used. I sort of have uh, uh, given uh, descriptive words for each of them. So appreciation for a system is all about the importance of cooperation versus competition. Knowledge about variation is about having a way to recognize what problems you're dealing with and want to solve. Theory of knowledge is about going about solving them, but doing so in a predictive kind of a way, not a reactive way, not looking in your rearview mirror in the car and saying, ah, that was the problem we just had. Okay, let's fix that one. It's looking ahead. 